Hello, everyone. Welcome on the Leaders Who Care podcast. Uh, today, I have the privilege to welcome another remarkable uh, leader who cares, who comes with uh, a deep experience, uh, someone who actually has spent um, years um, working as a naval officer in the nuclear submarines during the Cold War and has been uh, leading uh, industrial businesses for more than 20 years. Um, today, I have the privilege to welcome John Rene, who is a business leader, author, and a speaker. He's a co-founder, president, and CEO of Peak Demand, um, and also this is a global manufacturing products uh, company for electric utilities, and is also um, a founder of the Deep Leadership Podcast, uh, where his the philosophy is leadership is a people's business. Rene, what a, what a pleasure to welcome you and thank you for joining us today. Hi, Marion. Good good to have you. Good to be on the show and good to see you. Well, uh, I, I really have so many uh, um, uh, questions uh, for you today, but indeed, what a privilege and honor to have you today. Um, you have uh, such a remarkable story and a unique background, how, how being on a submarine re- uh, a really a nuclear submarine um, impacts your life to to really do what you do today. Um, tell us about yourself, especially going back to your naval uh, officer times. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I, I grew up in a in a blue collar town, so every every adult I knew was a blue collar worker involved in some sort of uh, service sector or manufacturing sector kind of job. So I, I grew up in an environment where people worked, people, you know, put on boots and jeans and and went to work every day. And, um, I had, I had this dream and desire to join the military and specifically go into submarines. I was fascinated with submarines as a young child and growing up, I would read more and more about stories of submariners and, and, and the role of submarines played. So, Somewhere along the line, I decided I wanted to be a submarine officer. And uh, what that meant is I had to go to college. And you typically have to get an engineering degree because you're, you, one of the things you have to do as a, as a naval officer on submarines is you have to be qualified in nuclear engineering. So you have to understand nuclear engineering and how to run the propulsion plant. So I didn't know anyone who had ever been to college. I, I, didn't, uh, I didn't know anyone who's ever been an engineer, but I decided at that point I would, I would pursue an engineering degree. So got, I got a mechanical engineering degree from a, from a great university, uh, got a four-year scholarship from the military, uh, and then I joined the submarine force right out of college. Um, I, I spent five years there. And we made seven deployments during my time on board. What was interesting during that time is that I really learned a lot about leadership being in a place where you were locked, enclosed in a metal can, essentially, for, you know, we would go out for 90 to 100 days at a time. And so it was a lot of really important leadership lessons I learned being in a place where you can't change out people. So you you have to deal with the crew that you deployed with. So you can't fire somebody, you can't hire somebody, you gotta, you can't, you have to de- you have to use what you have to get the job done. So I learned a lot of lessons, important lessons about leadership in that environment. I very much appreciate your, your your lessons and what you've learned during that time, uh, John. And uh, how did that uh, really um, impacted what you do today? What what are the most valuable lessons you have taken? Yeah, it's really interesting because um, one of the things that happens when you're leading in an environment like that there is there's a lot of things that are happening. So you are in an enclosed space, right? So you really get to know the people around you. So you build deep relationships with them because you stand these long watches together and you really get to know them. You know what they like, what they don't like, how they're motivated. And these things are really important to be able to understand the best ways to lead them. So it was this tight, close-knit environment. And the other thing is that every sailor was essential to be able to carry out the mission and get us home safely. So one of the other things I learned during that time was that every person is important to the mission. 
And so we have to, and I've learned that even through my days running manufacturing businesses, that every employee is critical to the mission. And sometimes we don't think that way as, uh, as senior managers, senior leaders, we say, oh, we can outsource that, or, oh, those people are, are on the shop floor aren't important, uh, uh, or the call center people, we, they aren't important. And, and when we think that way, right, when we, we make people less than what they really are to our business, I think it, I think it really affects how we treat them and they feel it too, when they feel it when senior management doesn't really appreciate them. So I learned the idea that every person's valuable to our business. Well, I love the uh, podcast philosophy. Leadership is a people's business. Uh, that, uh, that represents really uh, very much what, what you believe and I, I completely relate to. This is when you unlock from good to great, when you actually are able to um, bring together all of your resources uh, towards a common mission and actually fire them all up, which is not an easy thing to do. Mm. Um, how do you translate that uh, into your day-to-day operations uh, today? How do you motivate your your people, your employees? How, how do you treat them so that you can get the best of the best of them? Yeah, yeah. You know, you know, it's interesting because leadership is really simple at the end of the day. It's complex, but but it's really simple. It's about motivating a group of people to accomplish a goal. That's it. That's what it's all about. Now, what it's not about, it's not about um, emails, getting to email zero. It's not about um, being busy and being in meetings. Uh, and it's not about hiding from people in, in your office with the door shut and, uh, and doing what you're comfortable doing. It's about motivating people towards a goal, right? And that means you got to get out of your office. You have to spend time with your people. You have to know your people. You have to know how they're motivated and you've got to engage them in a way that they feel, uh, that they're part of the overall, uh, organization and they're, they're an important and essential piece of the mission. And I think when you do that, when you pe- treat people uh, with respect and you uh, and make sure they understand their role in accomplishing the, the big picture, the goal of the organization, then they then they uh, can they bring their passion and they bring their full selves to work. So uh, I think it's about really, truly engaging with people so they can fully engage in the business. Is that what inspired you to write your book? What, what, would, what were the reasons behind you, you have really uh, made a, such an impact with, uh, with becoming an author and, and sharing your, your lessons? Tell us more about that. Yeah, I would say about, about um, probably about 10 years ago, I, re- I started realizing that the way I led my business was different than all of my peers. I worked for 22 years in three global companies, and my business has always did better than my peers. And I got, I used to get a lot of accolades, a lot of rewards and all this. And so, in fact, a lot of my peers called me the golden child. Um, and so they would always kind of be a little jealous of my, my results, but I wasn't doing anything special. The thing that bothered me was like, all I'm doing is, is engaging with the team and bringing, and bringing a full team, right. You know, basically uh, tapping into the collective wisdom of the team to be able to accomplish the task. This was a simple thing I was doing. And this is what I learned in the military, which was, you know, d- you know, you have to basically, you know, go to your senior people, find out their best information and be able to put some of that to action to be able to accomplish the goal. So engage your people to engage the business. And so I've been doing that for years and being very successful, but, but I noticed others weren't. And it seemed like it was so simple. And so that's when I decided about 10 years ago, I should start writing about leadership. This seems to be something that I I have learned something on the submarine that made me uniquely uh, successful in business. And so I started writing articles for websites and uh, had my own blog. And then about four years ago, I decided to write a book. Uh, the first book was called I Have the Watch. And it was just, it's, it's, it's short stories of how to become uh, a more people-centric, uh, effective leader. And it just blew up from there. And then four years ago, I bought a microphone and started interviewing people like you, um, successful leaders, authors, entrepreneurs. And I wanted to learn, like, w- what is leadership to you and, and what's the best way we can lead people? And that sort of blew up as well. So I think it was it was a desire to 
um, share what I had learned through my you know long journey as a leader to this next generation of leaders to help them you know not make some of the mistakes I saw other leaders making over my career. This is uh, really great to hear the the story behind and what what inspired you to do all this. So it's very much linked to your own. Uh, impact and way of living, what what actually has happened to you, and uh, it's such a great way to give back. And one of the best ways that leaders can truly show up for their people, of course, is is really to. Um, and that's why it's called the leaders who care. I believe every leader should care. We shouldn't be a, a podcast called leaders who care, but uh, but in in actual fact, it's not always the case. So mm-hmm. you told you shared something quite nicely um, and unique, which is you said. You just need to tap into the wisdom of your people. Uh, so just to tackle that a little bit, how do you do that? You know, if for, for people that for leaders that maybe they're not tapping into their to the wisdom of their own team or not as effectively, um, is there like a few advices, quick uh, uh, quick advices that you can share with them to um, to perhaps transform or change? Because it's not just um, it's not just pretending uh, uh, to, but at the beginning, it, it starts on a journey. So if even if people are not there yet, how could they get, uh, uh, how could they become better leaders? Yeah, I think one of the things is, first of all, it's a mindset, right? So you have to have a mindset that the people working for you in your team are fully capable and they're, they, and they're very talented and they have great ideas. So if you go into it with this idea that I might find something from my interactions with employees that's going to help me get to the next level in my business, if you have that mindset, that makes things a lot easier, right? So if you think, oh, I'm just checking a box. They say I have to spend time talking to my people, so I'm going to go out and talk to people. And you're not really in it. So you, you know, if you think you're superior, your ideas are better than anyone else's, you're going to fail at this idea of uh, you know, trying to tap into the collective wisdom of your team. You have to go into it with the mindset that there are answers out there that are going to help you be better, right? And you've got to figure out how to do it. And so the way I initially did it, this is kind of interesting, is um, I did a program called Fridays on the Floor. So I was my first manufacturing plant. Uh, I was given, I was only 32 years old and I got my first manufacturing plant and one of the things I noticed is that the office people did the office thing and the, and the factory people did the factory thing. And so what I said was, how can I, and, and, and in the military, we were always combined. So the officers enlisted, we were standing watch together. We we're very close. So I said, well, how can I bring us together closely? So I cr- created a program where the first Friday of every month, I would work for four hours on a different area of the manufacturing plant so I could get to know the people, they could get to know me, and I could understand their frustrations. Well, through that process, and this happened over months and months and months, I started really understanding some of the frustration that the employees had, some of the great ideas that they had that never were listened to. And so they got to know who I was. I got to know who they were. And I would tell my management team, "You, you can't believe what I'm learning, right? And they didn't get it because they weren't doing it as well. And so I made the decision to have our entire leadership team do that every month. So every month, for the first Friday of the month, we would go out there, spend four hours in different departments, and then we would come back as a team and say, what did you learn? What's broken? What can we fix? What, 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 what did you hear that, that we need to implement? When we started doing that, we started listening to the employees and we started putting these things into action and we started fixing things that were broken. We started gaining ideas that we didn't know and that we, that we used. And, and as we continue to do that, the performance of the plant just continued to get better month after month after month, financial performance, operational performance, customer feedback, and uh, to the point where we were the most successful plant in, in our whole division. And it was simply by getting out of my office and spending time with people and getting to know them and letting them get to get to know me. It was about building those relationships. Well, uh, one of your... Um... One of your books is about leading your organization like a nuclear submariner. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us more about this analogy. Yeah, there's some things that are really unique about leadership from a from a submarine standpoint. I mentioned it earlier, you know, they lock when they lock the hatches and we go out to sea, you're you're stuck with the crew that you deploy with. Well, what does that mean? That means that you have to really um you have to be able to accomplish the, the mission 
with, with the team that you have, right? And so we don't get to pick that team, which is interesting because a lot of the leaders say, oh, I can't lead this team because I, the, you know, my predecessor picked this group of people, right? In the Navy, we didn't have a choice. We, we, got, we got a team of people. We have to figure it out, right? And so there was no escape from a bad colleague, a bad leader, a bad, uh, or a bad employee, in this case, a, a sailor. So we had, to get the, we had to get the most out of the people that we had. And I tell a story in the book about my worst sailor uh, on uh, in my first uh, first department. My absolute worst sailor was always getting into trouble. He he was he was full of mischief. He would he would he would he would always be doing something to get himself in trouble. And one of the things I realized is that he was very intelligent, and he would only get into trouble when he was bored. And so one of the things I said is like, well, how do I keep this guy from being bored? Right. And so. What I did is I put him in charge of training all the young uh, reactor operators who were coming onto the ship. He was number one guy to train everyone because he was phenomenal at his job. The other thing is he was an incredible maintenance guy. He could he could fix anything. And so I gave him the most challenging assignments and always put him in charge of those challenging assignments. Suddenly he wasn't bored. Suddenly he was adding a lot of value to my department. And uh, he became my worst from my worst sailor to my top performing sailor because I figured out what motivated him and what I needed to do to, to adjust and change to, to make him to be successful. And what, I tell that one story of this one sailor because this is the kind of mindset you have to have when you have employees. It's like, how can I uh, untap their full potential? What, what's the key to unlocking what they're going to be amazing at? And, and, and sometimes in, in the case of like leading businesses, you have people in the wrong roles and you you and if you get to know them you're going to realize that oh this guy this guy is a marketing guy that's in an operations role he's in the wrong spot and that's why he's struggling right um she she belongs more in the, in an hr field because she really deeply cares about the people issues but she's she's in a quality role and it's not fitting her her personality her her desires and likes but the only way you know that is by really getting to know your people and and then you can you can truly unlock their potential. I hear you. Well, this is a very simple steps that everyone can take and mm. uh, and really unlock and untap the potential. Um I'm a great believer and and I have a dream to see people thrive at work, uh, not survive, which is why uh, leaders who care was established actually to show um, to the wider world and to the audience that how you lead really matters and it uh, um, carries a fundamental um, ingredient. Um, what role did care played for you um, in your success as a leader? It's really interesting because I, I most of my career, I thought I was a servant leader. Um, and that's because I that's the only thing I'd really been exposed to in terms of you know, uh, a lot of a lot of typical, a lot of academic research around leadership doesn't reach practitioners like myself, and so I think I latched on to servant leadership at some point, which is the idea of um, you know supporting your team, giving them what they need, removing obstacles uh, so they can be fully successful. And I always did that throughout my career. As far as you know, I was the guy that uh, we would have a lot of em employee events, you know, like like picnics and and uh, and and Thanksgiving, you know, meals. And we would go to like we would rent out a theme park and take the all the employees to theme parks. And I'd always have I made sure that the employees had good good food in the break room and and access to news when they're on break. All these things just to make life better for them. But then I found, um, you know, in my work right now, I'm working on a doctorate degree. I found this idea called uh, transformational leadership. And transformational leadership says that, A, we're going we're gonna to do our best to support our people, but we're also going to help them become the best version of themselves at work in, uh, in pursuit of an organizational goal. And I would say that's probably more my leadership style, which is I want to take care of my employees. I want to support them. But I also want I realize that one of the biggest wastes in a company is when people don't live up to their full potential. So part of what I do and one way I care is to truly understand my employees and, 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 and help them reach uh, something that they really will, will they, they want to do, they love to do, and they're going to be really effective in doing it. So I try to help them reach their full potential 
in pursuit of the business goals. So those two things together. So uh, in, in the early days, I thought I was a servant leader, but I think my model more is this transformational leadership model. Uh, when you say you help them reach their full potential, uh, so you, you get to know them and understand mm-hmm. what sets their heart on fire, what their ambition is, and try to marry that with the, the organizational goals. Is that is that how, how we should understand? Yeah, that's it. So it's it's really understanding. And I, I look at sometimes building a team like building a puzzle. You know, you've got to get all the right pieces in the right place. Otherwise, the puzzle, the picture never comes together. And I think that um, through getting to know people, understanding their strengths, weaknesses, their desires, uh, you can say, ah, this is a puzzle piece that 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 is probably in the wrong spot. I need to move it over to this, this area of the puzzle. Uh, or... This is a bigger puzzle piece than I realized, and and I've got to take this and and put this at the center. So this so that's where you end up finding these uh, these leaders that are deep and sometimes deep embedded in your organization. You're like, oh shoot, this person is is capable of doing so much more than what they're doing today. And then how can I give them the the opportunity to do that? I'll be honest with you, I had a boss that did that. So. When I came into corporate America from the military, I was a design engineer. I worked in engineering. I worked in R&D. And I had a boss that's, that kept looking at me like, this guy can do a lot more than, you know, drawings on a piece of paper. I mean, he he was an officer in the military. He led, he led very complex things. And he gave me a chance to become the leader of the quality department. And then eventually I became the engineering manager. And then they gave me my first plant at 32 years old. So someone saw in me leadership potential and gave me opportunity. At 32 years old, I'd never run a manufacturing plant. Yet my boss said, go take on this, this, this manufacturing plant that was struggling and turn it around. And so that's the kind of boss I want to be is to find those uh, people that have this higher potential and put them in a place where they can really succeed and challenge them to you know, put them in stretch assignments to let them grow to what to fit into the role that they can they 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 have the ability to fit uh, fit into. Certainly, I fit into the role. I didn't in, in the beginning; it was definitely difficult, but eventually, I fit in the role, and I've been doing. I've been leading manufacturing plants ever since. So, yeah, it's, I'm glad I had a boss that that did that for me. That's really interesting because when you talk about growing and trans, you know, transformational leadership in the context of helping them to reach their full potential. I believe that's one of the fundamental human cravings, which is growth. Yeah. Um, and every one of us wants to grow. Um, of course, this is where the fine balance comes, not to burn out. It, it's like how can not to give them more than they can carry, in other words. Mm. Uh, and, that's, and this is where what, what you're, um, you talk about as finding that as assessing correctly if we talk about leadership. Um and uh, do you have you noticed a, a trend that people who have taken responsibility in their twenties or their earlier they started early, they tend to uh, be um, more successful leaders than others. That's a great question. Um, I, I've been leading since since my early twenties, so uh, you know, from a data point standpoint, yeah, that's certainly been the case in in, in my uh, my career. And I would say this: I say leadership is um, simple, but it's complex. It's like chess. You can learn how to play chess in a day, but to master chess, it takes a lifetime, right? And I think leadership is that way. So. You can you can learn leadership and be effective early, but I think the, the longer you spend time in the role, you learn um, nuances, tricks, um, uh, habits that that'll be that'll help you be more effective. That you that take time to learn that you can't read in a book. So I think the longer you're in it, I think the better it is that you the better um, you'll be. But that means that you those those uh, managers have or those leaders have a growth mindset. So those that say, oh, I've arrived, I've been leading for 10 years, I'm an expert, that's not, uh, those aren't the people that are going to be effective. It's the people that have a mindset that I'm, uh, that humble mindset that says, I still need to learn, I still need to get better. Those are the people I'm talking about. That's the, those are the ones that are going to be your great leaders. But that being said is that I've seen young people get it right from day one, and I love it. They 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 understand the value of people. They understand 
the impact that people can make in our organization and they and they get it on day one and they deliver on day one. So, uh, yeah, I it, it, it doesn't matter where you start. Um, it's just, you know, take the right approach, um, you know, you know, be very employee centric. I think I always say the number one rule of leadership is treat people with respect. If you do that, you're, you're, you're already starting from a good standpoint and you're going to and you're going to be effective if you just take that simple mindset into your new role. What kind of a leader is the new generation looking up to? Because it's mm-hmm. uh, obviously we, there's a lot of the great resignation. There's a, lo- a lot of uh, exposure, let's say, of uh, good or bad leadership in the last uh, few years is during COVID and we're starting yeah. to see even now. So um, we live in a very uncertain world. And uh, well, what is your take on that? Yeah, you know it's interesting because you know when I when I went into my career, you know, um, you didn't want to sh- switch jobs, right? You want to stay with one job as long as you could. It didn't look good for you if you switch job. Well, that's been taken off the table. It doesn't matter how many jobs you've had. So young people go where they uh, f- where they feel like they belong, and they feel like the company and the leadership is are on the right trajectory. They're they're on the right mission. So what I'm saying is that leaders more than ever now have to, you're competing for resources, you're competing for the best people. And how do you keep the best people engaged? Well, you have a mission that's exciting. You you have something that you're doing that gets them excited to go to work every day and gets them motivated to um, you know, to, to give their best to, to the cause. Now, here's where you lose people, the younger generation these days, when your words or your actions are inconsistent with the mission or inconsistent with what you say you're going to be as a company, right? So, uh, you know, it used to be that um, companies could do anything and employees would just have to take it, right? But right now, if you, uh, and we see that a lot, we see employee um, protests, you know, we've seen it at Google, we've seen it at Facebook, we've seen it at Netflix, where employees are saying, hey, you're doing something that's inconsistent with the goals of this organization. And they stand up to their bosses, uh, or they leave the organization. So this has never existed ever before. So you have to be consistent with what you say you're going to do, your actions have to meet your words. And if you do that, then people see that they can trust you as a leader, that's going to be someone that I want to work for because this person is is uh, is is trustworthy. They do what they say they're going to do, and I believe this this company is on a mission that I want to be part of. So you want to bring them on to this bigger mission, and that mission needs to be something that's gets them excited, gets them excited to go to work every day. Thank you, John. This has been really uh, uh, great to hear your thoughts on uh, on the topic of leadership and uh, really to go. Um, to go deeper, uh, as we said, and I encourage our audience, if they want to really uh, get much deeper, look at this, to look at your book, of course, and, and your podcast. Uh, if anyone wants to, um, uh, before, before I ask you my final question, uh, if anyone wants <laughs> to get in touch, uh, what, what is the best way, you know, what they might need? To, do you do any ad- advisory or consultancy uh, apart from your business? Because I know you're a full-time CEO. Yeah, I do mentor a few people and I do um, speak to colleges. Uh, I speak to organizations, but it's uh, it's a part time gig for me. So my full time job is my manufacturing plant. So the writing that I do, the podcast, uh, the consultancy, the, the, the mentoring I do is all uh, part time. It's all for, um, you know, I do it. I do it because I want to give back. So uh, but yeah, if you go to my website, John S. dot com, you can you can contact me there find links to my podcast, find links to my books, and also some of the, you know, if you want me to speak or if you need me, if you want to have me help you from a mentoring standpoint, all the, all the links are on there on the website. But mostly I'm a CEO, I'm running a business, and uh, and that's what I enjoy doing. And, I, and again, I'm at an age where I'm trying to, to, to pass on this knowledge to the next generation of leaders. My final question is if you had no limits uh, today and, and you were suddenly in charge of uh, um, of leading the world, let's say, and with <laughs> unlimited resources, what is one thing that you would like to, to change uh, since you talk about transformational leadership? Yeah, I think, 
uh, again, uh, my, my podcast, uh, we say it's to build a world with better bosses. I want to see a world where, um, where leadership is truly appreciated. So uh, it's not just something that's a footnote. You know, we teach marketing, accounting, uh, manufacturing. We teach all the hard skills. We, we fail in most cases to teach leadership. And I want to see a world uh, with better bosses. And so I want to see leadership as being something that is appreciated and, and people are promoted based on their leadership, not, not necessarily based on um, how well they, they, they achieve short-term results uh, and, 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 you know, and left all sorts of problems in their wake, which is what I saw in corporate life. I would say I wanted, I'd see a world where leadership it was tr is truly appreciated. Thank you so much, uh, Jean. Really appreciate uh, uh, your work and what you've been doing. Um, I wish you blessings to you and your team and your family and uh, keep spreading the word you do. And uh, thank you for being a leader who cares. Thank you, Marion. This is fun.